right, ladies and gentlemen, we're looking at part one of DNA, DNA structure and replication. Uh, the DNA structure should be a bit of a repeat uh, from the four previous grades, but the replication should be new and it has quite a lot of detail. All right, so let's take a peek here. Uh, we're going to start with what the basic building block is of DNA, and it's called a nucleotide. And there's three main parts, as you can see in the highlighted areas here. The first part is just a phosphate PO4. Uh, we usually just abbreviate it as just P. And then we have the deoxyribose sugar, which is made up of a five-sided sugar. Uh, and take note of these numbers. Uh, each of these little intersections is actually a carbon. And so what we do is we label these carbons based on their order, one, two, three, four, five. Uh, the three carbon and the five carbon will be important uh, later when we talk about actually laying these nucleotides down. Uh, and then the third one we have is a nitrogen base. And we have four, and you probably remember them. We have them as the A's, the G's, the C's, and the T's. Uh, we have a little more detail now. As you can see, we have two different types. We have ones that are called purines. These are double ringed in structure like this one here. Right? You can see the two different fused rings. So adenine and guanine are both purines. And then we have the pyrimidines, which is thymine and cytosine. And you might remember these differently as they were coming together, but they do do things that are called complementary base pairing. And in those, they have a specific one they always want to join with. But these are just the classifications based on their structure. So you can pause this now and get those ones done. Okay, so again, let's look at some more of the structure. We mentioned that it has a phosphate and sugar, but if we look at the overall, not just as a nucleotide, but as the overall DNA strand, we have this coiled structure, and these sides here are actually made up of the phosphate and the sugar. As we coil these up, um, it creates this thing that we call a double helix, because uh, we have two sides, two different strands of the DNA. Uh, in order, in between the different nitrogen bases, we pair it with what we call hydrogen bonds, which we'll see in a little bit. Uh, and then what happens is if you have a large section of DNA, we call those ones genes, and those genes is what ultimately creates proteins, which make up our um, all the things that happen in, in and structurally build up our body. So again, just to have a little peek here, we have our phosphate sugar backbone, just alternates phosphate sugar. And then we have our bases that are going to be paired together with hydrogen bonds. So as you can see, the A's and the T's have these two hydrogen bonds, and the G's and the C's have three hydrogen bonds. Okay, so you can pause that now and get those down. So now let's talk about replication. So if we have a certain amount of DNA, if we want to have more, we need to make it uh, essentially the same because all of our cells have the same amount of genetic information and the same type so if we get hurt and we need to build new cells we need to have the same amount of DNA in order to do that we need to replicate it before we split in half so our whole goal of replication is to take one segment of DNA a DNA helix and then copy it into two DNA helices and the reason why as I mentioned is, is for growth and repair when you guys have cell division occurring uh, we need DNA in each of those cells that are being uh, created and as we mentioned, they need to have the exact copy. And in order to do this, this is what they do. So if this is all of your DNA here, we have it looks like the latter form. We know that A's and T's go together. As we mentioned before, they're complementary. And G's and C's go together. So if we split it apart, we don't need to see that there's a T there because we know that they're complementary. So when we start adding it, we use these as a template. So we split these two up, and now we can just continually add new pairs together and now we have two perfectly identical identical strands okay so you can pause that and get it down and again I, I will give you the uh, the visuals so you don't have to draw anything okay so let's look at where we start in order to figure out where we start with replication we have something called uh, the origin replication and it's a bubble so as you can see here in this microscope picture these little blobs here are actually the bubbles that are opening up in the DNA and what happens is it gives it a spot for some of these uh, proteins that we're going to be using in a little bit uh, to, to attach to and start moving. As you can see, it moves out in both directions. So DNA replication will be happening in multiple spots, and eventually, once they come together, you end up having full strands of perfectly replicated DNA. Uh, you do not need to write down each individual thing. I just want you to realize that it starts at a replication bubble, and then it proceeds into these replication forks, which we'll see in a little bit here. All right, so as I mentioned before, we have enzymes and proteins that are going to be used to create this 
replicated DNA. And there's a lot to it. As you can see, we have polymerase, ligase, primase, uh, helicase, these binding proteins, topoisomerase. So there's there's a lot going on, but it might look a little bit overwhelming at first, but we'll, we'll, we'll take it a little bit by a little bit here. Okay, so you don't have to write that down, just a little Okay, so now let's look into it here. We have the process of replication. Uh, we usually start off by just explaining what the process is, is based on the enzymes that are happening. So the first enzyme we're looking at is we need this double-stranded helix to be uncoiled so we can get access to each of the nucleotides on the side. So the thing that unzips and unwinds this DNA helix is called helicase. And it does so by breaking the hydrogen bonds that exist between each of the adjacent nucleotides. Okay, so you can write that down. Helicase is marvelous. Unwinding the double helix at breakneck speed, slicing open those loose hydrogen bonds between the base pairs. The point where the splitting starts is known as the replication fork. It has a top strand called the leading strand, or the good guy strand as I call it, another bottom strand called the lagging strand, which I like to call the scumbag strand because it is a pain. In the butt. Once that's done, you have these strands that are now uncoiled, and we don't want them to coil back up again. So to prevent them from coiling back up again, we use single strand binding proteins. And so the single strand binding proteins will just attach here and prevent it from reforming, from repairing. Another one that we have to, to help ease the process is topoisomerase. A little bit of a mouthful. And what it does is it essentially uh, take some stress off of this joint right here. If this is being pulled apart, this little area here can get a lot of stress on it. So what this does is it continues to swivel around and it kind of backflows the pressure. So you can imagine if you have two coiled up strings and you're trying to separate them, as you start pulling it, it's going to get more stress on that little joint. And so this is just meant to relieve some of that. So you can pause it now to get that down. Okay, the next one is called primase. This one is more of a facilitator. We want to eventually add nucleotides to each side, but the thing that adds the nucleotide isn't very good at attaching. So primase, what it does is it lays down some nucleotides, but it's just going to lay down a few of the RNA types. And we'll talk about the difference between DNA and RNA in our next video. So for now, just know that there's just slightly structural differences between DNA and RNA. But it allows for the thing that's going to add other nucleotides to attach to it. Okay, so again, this is just a little bit of a placeholder for now, and we'll get into more detail in a second. So the next enzyme that we're going to talk about is DNA polymerase. This is the main enzyme that's going to be adding nucleotides to replicate the DNA. So every time we want to add nucleotides, we need to have this DNA polymerase doing it. And in order for it to attach, it needs a primer laid down. Okay, so you can pause that and then it hopefully will make a little more sense as we go. All right, so now we're actually looking at DNA polymerase. This is the, the vital enzyme that's going to be doing all the work. So what it's going to do is if you look at DNA polymerase, uh, it needs to add complementary nucleotides, but it has to do it in a specific way. It's a little bit of a pain because it always has to follow these rules. And so what it's going to do is it's going to attach here to the three prime end. And the three prime just refers to the, the carbon number of the nucleotide. So what it's going to do is it starts adding it here, but it has to do it in terms of a five prime to three prime direction because they're all complementary. So as you can see, if this is going this way, it's nice and easy. Every time uh, helicase opens up more nucleotides, it just adds more and more nucleotides. Perfect, great, grand. However, this is considered to be anti-parallel. And so what happens is that this DNA polymerase on the other side has to go from five prime to three prime as well, which means it's going this way away from the replication fork. So when we first lay down this primer here and the nucleotides start getting laid down, it gets to the end and now there's more space to start adding nucleotides. So it lays down another primer and then continues this way and this one and this way. So since it's always going away, it's, it's creating these, this DNA strand in pieces. And each of those pieces are called Okazaki fragments. Okay, so you can pause that and get it down. After it lays it down, now we still have these little red spots that are made up of RNA. But if we want DNA, it doesn't make sense for us to leave those other ones. So what happens is this DNA polymerase 1, compared to DNA polymerase 3, will go back over and it will replace the RNA 
uh, with DNA. So we'll have this nice continuous run. Thank the enzyme RNA primase. The leading strand only needs this RNA primer once at the very beginning. Then DNA polymerase is all, I got this, and it just follows the unzipping, adding new nucleotides to the chain continuously all the way down the molecule. Copying the lagging or scumbag strand is, well, he it's a freaking scumbag. This is because DNA polymerase can only copy strands in the 5 prime, 3 prime direction, and the lagging strand is 3 prime, 5 prime. So DNA polymerase can only add new nucleotides to the free 3 prime end of a primer, so maybe the real scumbag here is the DNA polymerase. Since the lagging strand runs in the opposite direction, it has to be copied in a series of segments. And here that awesome little enzyme RNA primase does its thing again, laying down an occasional short little RNA primer that gives the DNA polymerase a starting point to then work backwards along the strand. This is done in a ton of individual segments, each 1,000 to 2,000 base pairs long, each starting with an RNA primer. These are called Okazaki fragments. After the couple of married scientists who discovered this step in the process in the 1960s, and thank goodness they were married so that we could just call them Okazaki fragments instead of Okazaki hyphen someone's hyphen someone fragments. These allow the strands to be synthesized in short bursts, and then another kind of DNA polymerase has to go back over and replace all of those RNA primers, and then the little fragments gets joined up by a final enzyme called DNA ligase. Okay, so a little bit of a problem though. Once we replace that D or that RNA with DNA, there's still going to be little spots that aren't quite joined up yet on those Okazaki fragments. And so what happens is DNA ligase just comes back, it comes down and just connects the phosphate of one nucleotide to the sugar of another one. So it just ins ensures that it's been structurally uh, sound when it has been replicated. Okay, so you can jot that down.